So we've been in a identity series, your royal identity. And we've been talking about <clears throat> the blessings that come with belonging to the king. And, and today we want to focus in a little more clearly on your inheritance. There's a passage in Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Now, you might not know this, but it's possible that somebody has left you a big inheritance, okay? Uh, <clears throat> you'd be surprised. There's hundreds of millions of dollars that have been set aside by your rich aunt and uncle for you to embrace, but you don't know it. And so it just sits in government accounts and... Well, the government, they just received this money after a certain amount of time, so they're not interested in trying to track you down and give you this inheritance. And if you're wondering if that might be you, you can go to www.unclaimed.org to see if your name occurs in the unclaimed riches list. I looked, <clears throat> William Allen Lewis, and apparently my uncle spelled Allen differently, and so I'm not gonna get anything. I mean, could you imagine being oblivious to your rightful inheritance? There was a Michigan man making $10 an hour, and they tracked him down, and it turns out he had $24 million that his family, who he left and never came back to visit, had left for him. So uh, just imagine, you know, not being aware of your rightful inheritance. Uh, I think sometimes there's a gap between what you have and what you could have, a gap between who you are and who you could be. And, and this really describes an untold mass of people who live every moment of every day oblivious to their divine inheritance. You have been invited to be a child, a daughter and son of the living God. And with being a child, that means you get an inheritance. You know, my mom and I, we always have this little argument. She says, a good son provides for her mother. And I say, a good mother leaves an inheritance to her son. So we always have this stalemate there. And this is what Christmas is about. Jesus came to redeem those who were under the law. And the law means this. The rules that we were unable to follow because we had the sin virus in our lives. It's almost as if Jesus came to free us from the slavery we have to the rules we can't carry out. Talking about slavery, I saw on the internet the other day an actual modern-day slave auction. It was just radically painful. I cried. I mean, there was families being sold off, mother this way, father that way, the children. You see poor little girls with tears running down their eyes being purchased by lecherous men. You'd see strong young men being purchased because they were going to be sent off to the opium fields so that they could supply heroin to Europe. I mean, it, it just really broke my heart to, to see all this. And, and, and I realized each person was going to a different form of servitude. And, and that's kind of what happens to all of us, you know? We end up, you know what your <clears throat> area of struggle is, that place that always seems to supplant what the, the position of the Lord in your heart. And well, well, when you're reading through the Bible, you're gonna notice something, that when Jesus comes, or excuse me, when he came the first time, um, it says that he healed them all. In other words, he'd be out on a, 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 a preaching endeavor and all these folks would come to him and he would preach them all, to heal them all. Uh, it, it was kind of interesting that the disciples would get exasperated. You know, Lord, you know, can't you send them away? Because he would take the time to heal everybody who came into his presence. 
And I bring this up because, you know what, this is our divine inheritance. To come under his covering, he's taken the time because he'd like to heal you from whatever it is that's keeping you down. When Jesus comes, we're no longer enslaved to the powers and principles of this world any longer. Freedom is available to you. This is part of your spiritual inheritance. You might say that Jesus closed the gap between what we had and what's available, who we were and who we can be. I was reading through the different <clears throat> hymns, Christmas hymns, and hark the herald angel. No, Jesus was born that we may no more die. We were redeemed from the curse of death, born to raise from this earth. You see, friends, Jesus came and he gave us a brand new position before the Lord. You and I now have a natural born right to be a mature heir of the Lord. Uh, the Romans, the father, back in the Roman days, the father would say, okay, you are now of age where I can transfer to you my inheritance. It's something that I've seen over the years. You know, the child will turn 24, the parents would give them the inheritance, the next thing you know, they go buy a hot red sports car and crash it two weeks later. There goes the inheritance. You know, the father would say, okay, let me discern when you finally have arrived. Well, guess what? Jesus came into history and decided, you know what? The time is right. You are now going to be my children. First uh, John 3, 1, how great is the love of the father that has been lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. I want you to feel this right now. You are a daughter and son of Almighty God. Okay? And if you're like me, you go, well, <clears throat> uh, all the disqualifications come forward. Well, if you knew what I had said to my wife the other day, and if you knew what I was thinking about, you know, previously, and if you, you, you saw my history, and yeah, yeah, friends, <clears throat> God knows all that. And he sent Jesus to live the life that we were supposed to live. And then he transferred the righteousness that, that we needed to be in a relationship with God. And right now, because of that act, you are his daughter and his son. You're a child of God. He chose you. I mean, all of us, we know what it's like to be chosen for the team or chosen for the play or chosen for the position in an organization or a job. This is nothing compared to the fact that God has chosen you to be his family. And with the family, it comes an amazing gift. It's in John 17, 23. Jesus prayed to his father, love them as you have loved me. Do you feel loved by the father? Because that was the request that God the son Lift it up to God the Father. And when he prays for us, it happens. He put us into the place. By under his name, you and I are now definitively loved by God the way he loves his son. And that means we get to inherit all the amazing gifts that come from God. You know, we're surrounded by people who are trying to find out who they are, searching for their roots, trying to uncover their inner selves, trying to build their self-worth through all their achievements. Friends, you and I get to be secure in the knowledge that you are a child of the Father thanks to Jesus Christ. You don't purchase it. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's based completely on the tender mercy of the Father. And the Bible tells us what God has made available to us, the riches of his grace, the riches of his glory, the riches of his goodness, uh, the riches of his wisdom. But here's the, the, the amazing gift. You've been renewed. Okay, again, it's like the hymn, born to give us second birth. We used to be the old self, but now that Jesus has entered into your life, it's a new you. Okay? And he gives us his Holy Spirit. This is the proof. 
You know, we're, we're at Christmas time, we're, we're enjoying the gift that God gave to us, the Father, the gift that the, 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 excuse me, the Father gave to us, Jesus, and Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, and, and, and the Spirit's been given to us. It's been given to us. We don't do anything to acquire it. It's been given to us. All we have to do is embrace this amazing gift that, that has been given to us. This is all part of the salvation plan. Salvation isn't just waiting to get to heaven, okay? Salvation happens the moment you step in to your relationship with God. The moment you start lifting up a prayer request. The moment you decide, I'm going to believe, I'm going to pray for this, I'm going to pray for someone. Faith in who Jesus is activates all this for you. And, and, and I want you to hear something. God didn't send himself to us. He sent himself into us. Do you see the difference here? We don't merely have access to the riches of God. We have God himself. It's like God's promise to Abraham. I am your exceedingly great reward. God himself is the reward. You know, we, we want the rewards, right? We like to settle on the gifts because believe it or not, there's a lot of cool gifts that God gives to us. You know, you have a new position before the Lord. You, you are his beloved. You have a power source to overcome anything that gets thrown at you. You have protection and provision if you're willing to trust the Lord like, like Pastor Bill was saying at the offering. You know, we have a new purpose in life. Possibilities beyond what you ask or even think because of the power of the Lord within you. But the real gift is his presence. Not what he gives you, but the gift giver himself. Well, sometimes when God comes inside of us, he, he's kind of quiet about how he goes about things. It's kind of like wearing glasses. The purpose of glasses, okay, we don't ever see them except when we're looking for them, right? You know, and you have them up here on your head and you're going from room to room and you realize, oh, huh, I already have them. You just pull them down, okay? You don't look for glasses. You look through your glasses, and that's how they function. And it's kind of the way the Holy Spirit functions inside of us. Well, we're not really aware so much because we're too busy living with and for Jesus Christ. He's on the move through us, and we see his work because suddenly a problem becomes a possibility. Suddenly somebody that irritates us becomes an object of grace. Suddenly a fear-based situation becomes a, a decision that you and I say, I'm going to believe in the Lord's, the Lord's promise. And, and something comes up from within us that makes this happen. It, it's the Spirit of God growing you and shaping you and remaking you. And notice that the Holy Spirit's been sent into our hearts, not into our brains, not into our intellects, but into the very seat of our emotions, affections, desires. He resides in the control center of our being. Okay? You know, one of my favorite verses is Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I feel like I got a loophole on how to get anything I want from God, okay? All I have to do is delight in him, and he'll give me the desires of my heart. But the thing is this, you start delighting in the Lord, and his Holy Spirit starts expanding within you, and Jesus comes alive to you, and suddenly what you desire changes. The stuff that was so important to you doesn't have as much power or meaning because you see somebody who's hurting and you'd rather redirect your funds there. You, you, you choose to invest in a relationship with somebody who's hurt you because you know what? They were acting outside of the, the lens of grace. I, I want to I, I keep the relationship going. I want to invest in them. Suddenly you have a heart and a mindset and a perception of the world around you that's different because, well, you started enjoying what God's doing in your life and he changes who you are. He changes the way you think. Suddenly, uh, your, your thoughts are filtered through the lens of grace. Okay, he, again, he gets you to be compassionate to people that normally would irritate you. And, and whenever you and I have a concern, this Holy Spirit says, cast your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. How many of us have anxieties? You don't have to raise your hand. We got anxieties. The moment you have an anxiety, you cast it onto him. 
because he cares for you. This is a heart word. This is a love word. This is a relationship word. It's not because you belong to me and I'm going to take care of you. It's because I love you and I got you. And I'm never going to let you go. Have you ever been standing alone in a crowd and suddenly you start talking to the Lord and you realize, huh, I'm not alone. I got Almighty God here with me. And suddenly you prefer to be alone with him because that other person is going to chit-chat about stuff you don't want to talk about. And what's cool is the Lord is there and he knows who you are. He knows what's on your mind. He knows what's hurting your heart. And, and you get to stay in this close relationship with him. You know, I, I'm supposed to be talking about our inheritance, you know, all those cool things that God gives you. And it's a long list. But again, the best gift is the, give, the gift giver himself. God with us. And it gets activated in our prayer life. You enter right into the presence of the Lord, just like your kids. They come walking into your room, and they have access, and, and it's just the way it is. Okay? You love them. They have special access. You open it up to them, and, and it's the same with God. You just go walking into his presence. You don't have to have the right prayer formula. You don't need to know the right combination of words. You don't have to have been good enough. You don't have to do enough. You are his child. And this is what it says in Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we will receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. This word is the most important one missing. Confidence. You get to walk into his presence. The other day I had a bad thought and I immediately covered it with a good thought. And I went forward with the Lord. And as I was going forward with the Lord, I thought, you know, the old me would have had a bad thought and go, oh, I can't believe you still think this way. Haven't you grown out of this? How come the mercy of God isn't inside of you? And I would have beaten up on myself and had to spend enough time apologizing. And, and no, I've been forgiven. The bad thought, whoop, stopped it in mid-think, covered it with a good thought, and just stayed in that relationship. That's how it works. This is the way it's, you just have confidence. Your sins are forgiven, you don't have to stir over them. You know, I used to have a, a friend <clears throat> when I was growing up, his family owned a local movie theater in town, okay? And so it was kind of cool, because if you went with him, you got in for free. And not only did you get in for free, you would not have to sit with all the other common folk, you could go up to the projection booth and look down and see the movie from a totally different perspective. You just felt so honored. You felt like you were in the in crowd because I was with him. Well, guess what, friends? You're with Jesus, and he knows the owner of the world. And he's invited you into his theater, to a relationship with his father, and says, Dad, I want you to meet another one of your daughters, another one of your sons, and we get to have that relationship with him. But friends, it's even more intimate than this. Have you ever been in that spot where you're so overwhelmed with sorrows or fears or frustrations that you don't even know how to pray? Now the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. When you and I can't express ourselves, Guess who starts talking? The Holy Spirit. You know, at my second church, we had a deaf ministry. And so when I would be preaching, the, the, the interpreter would be over on the side, and, and all the deaf people sat over there. Oh, hopefully you can hear me okay, all right. But they would sit over there, and he would interpret. And it was amazing because as I would tell a funny joke, and the congregation would laugh, they would laugh. Because he told my joke correctly. I would tell a sad story and everybody would be all overcome with emotion and tears would show up. Same thing would happen with them. It was like it, the, the, he knew how to communicate the heart of the speaker. And this is my point. The Holy Spirit knows what's going on with you. 
He knows your brokenness and your boldness, your triumphs and your tears, your strengths and your struggles, your decisions and doubts. He knows everything about you. He brings them to the Lord, even when we just don't know how to talk to him. In other words, you get to rest in your relationship with God and enjoy his covering, his presence, his promises made to you. You know, I used to be a boxing coach. And sometimes I'd get some timid kids that would come into the gym. And, and, you know, there's two ways to throw in a punch, okay? You could throw a punch like this, or you could step into it and throw a punch like that. Two definitely different kinds of punches, okay? One's a swat, and the other one's going to change the direction of the fight. And so I would always tell these kids, step into it, move forward, when I would be, you know, they'd be in a fight and I would be yelling from the side, step into it. Because, you know, I didn't want to have to sit there that long. I wanted them to knock them out so we could go home. <laughs> and, 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 you know, this was a ministry for me, jabbing for Jesus. And um, <clears throat> this one kid gave his life to the Lord and, and um, he actually went on to be a minister. But, but later in life, I get a letter from him. And he says, hey, coach, I still remember what you taught us, whether it was in the ring or in life, step into it, move forward. And he, he, he put a, a Bible verse next to his letter, Exodus 14, 15, when God told Moses, tell the people to move forward. Move forward towards the Red Sea. And when they moved forward, that's when it parted. That's when they all got saved. That's when the Lord showed up. And I bring this up because it's friends, when you and I move forward into our identity, that's when all that we inherit is given to us. The power to overcome. It's when we decide to move forward and watch him show up to trust his provisions and protection. Had somebody who prayed for something big and it didn't happen, and you know what he said? Even if he doesn't, that's my God. And that faith alone opened up a call to the ministry. Okay? I'm just telling you, when you and I decide to embrace who we are as his daughters and sons, life changes. I found this cool statement, Christ came down at Christmas from where he was to where we are, so he could lift us up from where we were to where he is, to move us forward towards him, to move us forward. And this Christmas, I want all of us to step in to our identity and embrace our inheritance. There's lots of gifts, but there's nothing like the gift of God himself that he's made available to us. Well, this one lawyer hired a detective agency to locate a missing heir who had inherited $120 million, okay? We gotta find this person so we can get him his 120 million and the the, the detective agency says, I'm gonna put my best person on the job. This young woman is vivacious, she's determined and if anybody can find your heir, it'll be her. Well, a few weeks later, a lawyer receives a call from the female detective. Hey, I've got good news. I found your missing heir. The lawyer says, that's great, where is he? She says, oh, he's right here with me in the hotel. Um, we'll be back as soon as our honeymoon's over. (laughs) This woman saw a good thing and she grabbed a hold of it. And I just want you to know there's a good thing that's been extended to you. That's the presence, the power, the love of Jesus Christ. Because God loves you that much. And I want so much for all of us to embrace this inheritance. You know, I've asked Pastor Bill if he could kind of illustrate for us the dynamics of of this amazing relationship with God. So I was in a conference recently. We were talking about identity, and the topic of sin kept coming up. I began to realize that I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, the the world doesn't have a sin problem. It has an identity problem. That doesn't mean that sin doesn't exist and isn't an issue, but the only reason it's an issue is because we don't know who we are. 
And we don't understand fully what God in Christ did in the birth, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And, and if we don't know fully what he did, then we'll live according to a false identity. So to wrap this entire series that Pastor William and I have been doing about inheritance, about identity, about bloodline, about royalty together, I want to leave it with a simple illustration. We're going to call this the God chair. And God begins things by making man in his image and likeness. You're not God and he's not you. But you say, well, you mean I look like God? No, 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 no. The Bible says God is spirit, but at the core of your being, so are you. As a matter of fact, when God chose to come and and join the human race as one of us in Christ, we couldn't tell him apart from anyone else except by what he did. God and man begin in the garden in a face-to-face encounter. Man's first conscious experience is opening his eyes to behold a God that adores him. And man and God have this beautiful relationship face-to-face. They walk together in the cool of the day. They're communing together. There's relationship happening here. And a deceiver comes to man and convinces man to turn away from God. Now, we have an idea here at this point that what God does is he gets offended because we turned away from him, and he turns away from us and says, get out of the garden. But that's not exactly what takes place. See, we have broken relationship with God. There's a covenant between God and man, and we have walked away from it. What God does is instead of turning away from us, he actually does this. He confronts us. There's a face-to-face encounter and a new covenant is created and we say, yes, thank you for receiving us back. But eventually, we want to do our own thing and go our own way. And over and over again, God comes and confronts us face-to-face and this happens time and time and time again until finally, God decides we're trying something new now. We're going to do something new. We're going to call it a new covenant and God... Seemingly like we're all by ourselves, steps into our story in the form of Jesus Christ. And now God and man begin relationship again, but in a whole new way. God has now made himself in our image to redeem us from a false identity that we've embraced to redeem us back as sons and daughters. And how is he going to do it? Well, Jesus shows up and he starts doing amazing things. He starts healing people. He starts resurrecting the dead. He does all kinds of wonderful things to demonstrate the love of the Father. And do we exalt him? No, we kill him. That's where he is. And now we are the God of our own making. We've killed our own creator. He has now died at the hands of our wrath. Certainly, we can never be forgiven again. But God knows what's going to happen. And so, when we kill our own creator, he doesn't leave us alone. He takes us into the grave with him. When he takes us into the grave with him, he's beginning a process of dealing with the sin issue once and for all. But he doesn't leave himself nor us in this grave. He raises us together with him. Raises us to what though? Are we back to the garden, this face-to-face communication? Well, yes, to some extent, but it's more than that. It starts out like this, but then we, we go, oh, we do something that God doesn't like, and so we turn away, and then we think he turns away too. Does he? See, if we live our entire Christian life like this, you'll live what I would call eternally insecure. I sin, he comes back to me when I repent, but then I turn away and he turns away and he turns his back on me until I turn back toward him and then he... And if you live your life like this, as a Christian, you find yourself most miserable, as many of you maybe have found. But the way we began at the very start of this story is what the cross brings us back to. Because now, as Pastor William beautifully said this morning, we're not just a servant of God. We're not just a, 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 a friend of God. We're actually in Christ. This is what the cross did. It brought us into reconciled union with the Father again. 
And now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, God was in Christ reconciling. The word reconciling means to make at one. Reconciling the world to himself. And the way he did it was by not counting your sins against you. And then it goes on to say he's committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, you go tell everybody what's happened. And so then Paul finishes 2 Corinthians 5 out with this phrase. We, as ambassadors of God, are making a plea to you on behalf of God. Be reconciled to Christ. And this is my plea to you today. Don't live your life for another second with a perspective of distance and separation between you and God. Recognize that he, by his righteousness, has brought you back into a reconciled union. And that's why we can preach the messages we preach this whole, this whole series on identity, on inheritance, on the power of the bloodline as he's given us a divine blood transfusion, on the reality that he has brought us back at one with him. See, when this union happens, one of two things is gonna take place. Either a holy God is gonna lose his holiness or an unholy man is gonna lose his sin. And God doesn't lose. And he steps into our story, reconciles us to himself, and says, you're my son, you're my daughter. I love the line that Pastor Williams said at the beginning of this message. You're a son, you're a daughter, you're a child of God. You can't do anything about it. It's not even your fault. You can't take credit for it. Rest in the goodness of it. But I would say this, have you made a choice, have you made a decision to say yes to Jesus? This is my appeal to you today. See, to step into the realization that there's no distance or separation, that you don't have to live your life constantly thinking, has God turned away from me? To say yes to Jesus is to receive by faith what Christ did in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. Would you stand with me this morning? And I just wanna pray a prayer over you. I'm going to invite you to, just from your heart, to come into agreement with what I'm about to say. And if this resonates with you, maybe this becomes the morning that you say yes to Jesus. Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray you would do a quick work all over this room. God, none of us in ourselves feel worthy to be called your sons and daughters, but you say we are, so therefore we surrender to what you believe about us. And by faith today, we say yes to you. We say yes to all that you say about us. We say yes to your holiness resting upon and within us. We say yes to your love moving through us to change and impact the world around us. We say yes to your grace, your grace that frees us from all sin and awakens us to who you say we are. Thank you, Jesus, for saving for loving us and this morning from a heart, we say yes to you, yes to you. I invite you to finish this, this uh, service and this series with us today by making a declaration in this song, he shall reign forever and ever. <laughs>